Death and the Woman by Gertrude Atherton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A.C. Bogus. Death and the Woman by Gertrude Atherton. Her husband was dying, and she was alone with him. Nothing could exceed the desolation of her surroundings. She and the man who was going from her were in the third floor back of a New York boarding house. It was summer, and the other boarders were in the country. All the servants except the cook had been dismissed, and she, when not working, slept profoundly on the fifth floor. The landlady also was out of town on a brief holiday. The window was open to admit the thick, unstirring air. No sound rose from the row of long, narrow yards, nor from the tall, deep houses annexed. The latter deadened the rattle of the streets. At intervals, the distant elevated lumbered protestingly along, its grunts and screams muffled by the hot, suspended ocean. She sat there plunged in the profoundest grief that can come to the human soul. For in all other agony, hope flickers, however forlornly. She gazed dully at the unconscious breathing form of the man who had been friend and companion and lover during five years of youth too vigorous and hopeful to be warped by uneven fortune. It was wasted by disease. The face was shrunken. The night garment hung loosely about a body which had never been disfigured by flesh, but had been muscular with exercise and full-bodied with health. She was glad that the body was changed, glad that its beauty, too, had gone some other wear than into the coffin. She had loved his hands as apart from himself, loved their strong, warm magnetism. They lay limp and yellow on the quilt. She knew that they were already cold and that moisture was gathering on them. For a moment, something convulsed within her. They had gone, too. She repeated the words twice and after them forever. And the while, the sweetness of their pressure came back to her. She leaned suddenly over him. He was in there still, somewhere. Where? If he had not ceased to breathe, the ego, the soul, the personality was still in the sodden clay which had shaped to give it speech. Why could it not manifest itself to her? Was it still conscious in there, unable to project itself through the disintegrating matter, which was the only medium its creator had vouchsafed it? Did it struggle there, seeing her agony, sharing it, longing for the complete disintegration which should put an end to its torment? She called his name. She even shook him slightly, mad to tear the body apart and find her mate, yet even in that tortured moment realizing that violence would hasten his going. The dying man took no notice of her, and she opened his gown and put her cheek to his heart, calling him again. There had never been more perfect union. How could the bond be so strong if he were not at the other end of it? He was there, her other part. Until dead, he must be living. There was no immediate state. Why should he be as entombed and unresponding as if the screws were in the lid? But the faintly beating heart did not quicken beneath her lips. She extended her arms suddenly, describing eccentric lines above, about him, rapidly open and closing her hands as if to clutch some escaping object, then sprang to her feet and went to the window. She feared insanity. She had asked to be left alone with her dying husband, and she did not wish to lose her reason and shriek a crowd of people about her. The green plots in the yard were not apparent, she noticed. Something heavy like a pall rested upon them. She understood that the day was over and the night was coming. She returned swiftly to the bedside, wondering if she had remained away hours or seconds, and if he were dead. His face was still discernible, and death had not relaxed it. She laid her own against it, then withdrew it with a shuddering flesh, her teeth smiting each other as if an icy wind had passed. She let herself fall back in the chair clasping her hands against her heart, watching with expanding eyes the white sculptured face which, in the glittering dark, was becoming less defined of outline. Did she light the gas, it would draw mosquitoes, and she could not shut from him the little air he was mechanically grateful for, and she did not want to see the opening eye, the falling jaw. Her vision became so fixed that at length she saw nothing, and closed her eyes and waited for the moisture to rise and relieve the strain. When she opened them, his face had disappeared, the humid waves above the housetops put out even the light of the stars, and night was come. Fearfully, she approached her ear to his lips. He still breathed. She made a motion to kiss him, then threw herself back in a quiver of agony. They were not the lips she had known, and she would have nothing less. His breathing was so faint that in her half-reclining position she could not hear it, could not be aware of the moment of his death. 
She extended her arm resolutely and laid her hand on his heart. Not only must she feel his going, but so strong had been the comradeship between them, it was a matter of loving honor to stand by him to the last. She sat there in the hot, heavy night, pressing her hand hard against the ebbing heart of the unseen and awaited death. Suddenly an odd fancy possessed her. Where was death? Why was he tarrying? Who was detaining him? From what quarter would he come? He was taking his leisure, drawing near with footsteps as measured as those of men keeping time to a funeral march. By a wayward deflection, she thought of the slow music that was always turned on in the theater when the heroine was about to appear or something uneventful to happen. She had always thought this sort of thing ridiculous and inartistic. So had he. She drew her brows together angrily, wondering at her levity, and pressed her relaxed palm against the heart it kept guard over. For a moment the sweat stood on her face. Then the pent-up breath burst from her lungs. He still lived. Once more the fancy wantoned above the stunned heart. Death, where was he? What a curious experience, to be sitting alone in a big house. She knew that the cook had stolen out, waiting for death to come and snatch her husband from her. No, he would not snatch, he would steal upon his prey, as noiselessly as the approach of sin to innocence, an invisible, unfair, sneaking enemy with whom no man's strength could grapple. If he would only come like a man and take his chances like a man, women had been known to reach the hearts of giants with a dagger's point, but he would creep upon her. She gave an exclamation of horror. Something was creeping over the windowsill. Her limbs palsied, but she struggled to her feet and looked back, her eyes dragged about against her own volition. Two small green stars glared menacingly at her just above the sill. Then the cat possessing them leaped downward and the stars disappeared. She realized she was horribly frightened. Is this possible? She thought. Am I afraid of death and of death that has not yet come? I have always been a rather brave woman. He used to call me heroic. But then with him it was impossible to fear anything. And I begged them to leave me alone with him as the last of earthly booms. Oh, shame! But she was still quaking as she resumed her seat and laid her hand again on his heart. She wished that she had asked Mary to sit outside the door. There was no bell in the room. To call would be worse than desecrating the house of God. And she would not leave him for one moment to return and find him dead, gone, alone. Her knees smote each other. It was idle to deny it. She was in a state of unreasoning terror. Her eyes rolled apprehensively about. She wondered if she should see it when it came, wondered how far off it was now, not very far. The heart was barely pulsing. She had heard of the power of the corpse to drive brave men to frenzy, and had wondered, having no morbid horror of the dead. But this, to wait and wait and wait, perhaps for hours past the midnight, on to the small hours, while that awful, determined, leisurely something stole nearer and nearer. She bent to him who had been her protector with a spasm of anger. Where was the indomitable spirit that had held her all these years with such strong and loving clasp? How could he leave her? How could he desert her? Her head fell back and moved restlessly against the cushion, moaning with the agony of loss she recalled him as he had been. Then fear once more took possession of her. She sat erect, rigid, breathless, awaiting the approach of death. Suddenly, far down in the house on the first floor, her strained hearing took note of a sound, a wary, muffled sound, as if someone were creeping up the stair, fearful of being heard. Slowly, it seemed to count a hundred between laying down each foot. She gave a hysterical gasp. Where was the slow music? Her face, her body were wet, as if a wave of death sweat had broken over them. There was a stiff feeling at the roots of her hair. She wondered if it was really standing erect. But she could not raise her hand to ascertain. Possibly it was only the coloring matter freezing and bleaching. Her muscles were flabby. Her nerves twitched helplessly. She knew that it was death who was coming for her through the silent, deserted house. Knew that it was the sensitive ear of her intelligence that heard him, not the dull, coarse-grained ear of the body. He toiled up the stair painfully, as if he were old and tired with much work. But how could he afford to loiter with all the work he had to do? Every minute, every second, he must be in demand to hook his cold, hard finger about a soul struggling to escape from its putrefying tenement. But probably he had his emissaries, his minions, for only those worthy of the honor did he come in person. He reached the first landing and crept like a cat down the hall to the next stair, then crawled slowly up as before. Light as the footfalls were, they were squarely planted, unfaltering, slow. They never halted. Mechanically, she pressed her jerking hand closer against the heart. Its beats were almost done. They would finish, she calculated, just as those footfalls paused beside the bed. 
She was no longer a human being. She was an intelligence and an ear. Not a sound came from without. Even the elevated appeared to be temporarily off-duty. But inside the big, quiet house, that footfall was waxing louder, louder, until iron feet crashed on iron stairs and echo thundered. She had counted the steps, one, two, three, irritated beyond endurance at the long, deliberate pauses between. As they climbed and clanged with slow precision, she continued to count, audibly and with equal precision, noting their hollow reverberation. How many steps had the stair? She wished she knew. No need. The colossal trampling announced the lessening distance in an increasing volume of sound not to be misunderstood. It turned the curve. It reached the landing. It advanced slowly down the hall. It paused before her door. Then knuckles of iron shook the frail panels. Her nerveless tongue gave no invitation. The knocking became more imperious. The very walls vibrated. The handle turned swiftly and firmly. With wild, instinctive movement, she flung herself into the arms of her husband. When Mary opened the door and entered the room, she found a dead woman lying across a dead man. The End of Death and the Woman